You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary. To the sweetest girl I know. Goodbye, Piccadilly. Hello everyone and welcome to History of the Great War episode 201. A big thank you goes out to Adam, Bobby, and Zachary, especially to Zachary for his very generous support on Patreon, where they now get access to special ad-free versions of all of these episodes, plus special Patreon-only episodes once a month. If that sounds interesting, head on over to patreon.com slash historyofthegreatwar to find out more information. This is our first episode of Season 6 of the podcast, which I am titling Aftermath. After the First World War ended on the Western Front on November 11, 1918, and on other fronts at around the same time, Europe did not just suddenly go back to the relative peace of 1914. The war and the strains that it placed upon the societies around Europe would result in fightings and conflict for over five more years. Over the next 30 episodes, we will be discussing some of those conflicts. The first half of the episodes will focus on Russia and Eastern Europe as the Bolsheviks struggled to cement their power, and then looked beyond their own borders in their quest for an international revolution. Then we will discuss the events in the Middle East, with the Greeks invading Anatolia and revolts against British rule in Egypt and Iraq. Then we will shift focus to an area we've not discussed since 2016, Ireland, as a civil war begins. Finally, we will end with several episodes on who else but Germany. We will discuss the political developments in Germany after the war and the growing frustration of the French as they tried to get their reparations money. This will lead us to the Ruhr Crisis of 1923, which is where our narrative will end. There will be one more questions episode before the end of the year, so make sure to get your questions in. The email is historyofthegreatwar at outlook.com. Again, historyofthegreatwar at outlook.com. And everything around the First World War or before or after is fair game for those questions. As always, thank you for listening. And we're in the end game now, so I hope you enjoy the next 30 episodes. The war would cause some amount of chaos in many of the countries of Europe, but nowhere would that chaos be as destructive or deadly as in the former Russian Empire. Over the course of the four years between 1917 and 1921, the estimates vary for how many people were killed in Russia, deaths attributable to the Russian revolutions and then the Civil War. Some numbers are as high as 10 million. That number includes far more than just combat casualties, and includes millions of civilian deaths due to economic disruption. We spent episodes in 2017 discussing the Russian revolutions from February and October 1917, and while they ended with the Bolsheviks in power, the struggles within Russia were far from over at the end of 1917. The exact dates for what should be considered the Russian Civil War are a bit fuzzy, with many different dates given by many different historians depending on when they mark the transition from revolution to civil war, and then from civil war to just domestic disturbances. But what is known for certain is that during the period from 1917 to 1923, several different leaders, groups, and armies would all vie for power within the country. On one side would be the Bolsheviks, who would later refer to themselves as the Communists. This group would be led by men like Lenin and Trotsky, and other revolutionaries who had played an important role in the October 1917 revolution. Their most famous enemies were the Whites, led by old Tsarist army officers, but the Bolsheviks, or the Reds, would also struggle against armies known as the Blacks or Anarchists, and the Greens, which were made up of peasants. The whole situation was very confusing, and it defies an easy explanation, as the fighting ebbed and flowed over hundreds or even thousands of miles of territory which had formerly been part of the Russian Empire. Often, histories simplify the story a bit too much, casting the Reds as a ruthless, bloodthirsty set of conquerors hellbent on destroying the democratic whites. 
The actual truth was that the whites and the reds and every other group in Russia during this period were as diverse as the people who led them. They all had different goals and expectations, and they all tried to achieve them in different ways. They all believed that their path forward, be it communism, socialism, democracy, monarchy, were the best way forward for Russia. They saw everyone else as the enemy of that future. This led to military clashes from the Baltics to Ukraine to the Caucasus to Siberia and pretty much every place in between. It led to drastic changes in the Bolshevik platform as they struggled to cope with the challenges placed before them by the war. And when it was over, the Bolshevik or communist platform was irrevocably changed in ways that the leaders in 1917 probably never could have imagined. Today we will look at the situation in Russia after the October Revolution had brought the Bolsheviks to power. In my opinion, the Russian Civil War began at that moment, almost as soon as the Bolsheviks had taken control of the government in Petrograd. They would be taking control of a country racked by four years of war, a war that was still ongoing in Western Europe, and one that had went very poorly for the Russian Empire. Over the next five episodes, we will dig into the communist government that was created early in the Civil War, their clashes with the whites who would become the greatest threat to a communist future, and also discuss how that conflict spilled out into atrocities committed by both sides, often referred to as the Red and White Terrors, which would leave astonishing levels of suffering in their wake. If you remember back two years ago, one of the biggest drivers of the Russian Revolution, both in February and in October, was food. To put it simply, there was not enough food making it to the cities, and this caused all of the other problems caused by the war to be exacerbated. After the Bolsheviks came to power, they could not just magically solve this problem, and in fact food shortages would continue, and in some ways they got worse. Due to the change in government and the overall lack of support for the Bolsheviks in the countryside, the peasants who had the food lost faith in both the government and the paper money that they issued, and with paper money being the primary method of exchange between the cities and the countryside, this made it challenging to import enough food into the cities. Theoretically, in a per perfect communist system, this exchange would be handled by the government, but the power that the Bolsheviks could project in the early days after the revolution was highly focused in the cities, and was far less effective in the countryside. One of the reasons that the Bolsheviks had trouble extending support into the peasant areas was due to the specific power structures that were in place in October 1917. The February Revolution had offered the peasants the opportunity to throw off their old landowning masters. This gave the peasants the feeling that for the first time, maybe they controlled their own destiny. This meant that they were far less receptive to the Bolshevik message, which was so focused in the cities on the factory workers and soldiers taking power back from the bourgeois overlords. The peasants felt like they'd already done that, and they were doing quite well. Thought they were. To me, this power projection problem makes, makes something pretty clear. The leaders of the Bolsheviks who took power in 1917 had, had a really good idea about the power dynamics in the cities. Workers, factory owners, sailors, army officers, army soldiers. However, the power dynamics in the rural areas of Russia were completely different, and they just not, did not have a good grasp on it. Especially after the upheavals present during the February Revolution, which broke down many of the existing power structures. This would put the Bolsheviks at a disadvantage in every topic that involved the peasants, including food to the cities and the mobilizing of the population of the countryside for the Civil War. They were not completely lost, and they would very quickly begin to play to their strengths. The Bolsheviks were a party that was created and molded by underground work, and so they used those skills and experience in the countryside, just like, like before 1917 in the cities. In the early years of the Civil War, they found themselves in the minority in the rural areas, and so they defaulted back to using secret intelligence networks and slowly building up their power. This would lay the groundwork for later years when they were strong enough to truly assert their power in these rural areas. So we do have a pretty good idea about overall Bolshevik support in the countryside right after the revolution, because there were elections in December 1917 that were held throughout the country, and they are often cited because these elections would be the last that would occur before the civil war sort of raged through the country and threw it into chaos. For a party that had just taken control of the government in Petrograd, the Bolsheviks 
did not do fantastic in this election. They only received between 20 and 35% of the total vote, with other parties receiving substantially more support, with the highest being the SRs, or Social Revolutionaries, who got above 40%. There were three major political parties who took part in these elections outside of the Bolsheviks, the SRs, the Mensheviks, and the primary non-socialist party, the Constitutional Democrats, or as they are better known, the Cadets. Each of these groups would be in a somewhat interesting position in the coming civil war. There was a very large rural and urban divide, with the Bolsheviks receiving almost all of the votes in the large cities like Petrograd and Moscow, and most of the rural votes going to the SRs and Mensheviks. This was a serious problem for the SRs and the Mensheviks due to the challenges that were involved in mobilizing the geographically diverse peasantry, a problem that would not be present in the cities. While they were oppositional parties, both the SRs and Mensheviks would work with the Bolsheviks for some time, at least part of their parties would. However, there would eventually be a falling out between the groups that we will dig into next episode. The cadets, on the other hand, would quickly find themselves vilified by all of the socialist groups. This was problematic for them because they were not really supported by the true forces of reaction either, because almost all of those coalesced around leaders who were hoping to bring back something even further away from a constitutional democracy. This made it challenging for the cadets to generate a support base that was strong enough to stand on its own, and they would soon be absorbed into the growing white movement. Together, these groups received more votes than the Bolsheviks, and this led the Bolsheviks to allow the assembly to meet for just one day, at which point they dissolved the assembly with some help from a unit of armed sailors who surrounded the building in which the assembly met. This would truly put the Bolsheviks in complete power. Now, while the Bolsheviks were trying to work through their first political challenges within Russia, they were also preparing for something bigger. For the stated goals of the Bolsheviks, right from the beginning, was to spread their revolution beyond Russia and into the rest of the world. These efforts would begin with areas that were nearby, like Estonia, Latvia, Finland, and Ukraine, with these countries seen as critical stepping stones towards further advances into Europe, with Germany seen as the key to the entire world revolution. I think it's good to just briefly discuss the Bolshevik actions in some of these countries, even though most of them would make it, will make appearances in our later episodes. The Baltic countries, given their relative proximity to Petrograd, were very important in Bolshevik decision-making. Of the countries in this region, Estonia, Latvia, and I would consider Lithuania on that list as well, the one that would most immediately impact the early stages of the Civil War would be Latvia. In Latvia, the radical left political groups had a strong base of support. In 1917, the Bolshevik party would receive over 70% of the total vote from the local parliament. This would result in the Bolsheviks receiving some crucial early support from the Latvians, and none of that support was as crucial to the overall success of the revolution as the Latvian rifles. The Latvian riflemen were a military unit, and by far the most effective unit in the Red Army for much of 1918. Unlike many military formations that were loyal to the Bolsheviks, the Latvian rifles were organized and acted like an actual military force, and they had the training to back it up. Unlike many other units, which behaved and performed more like groups of revolutionaries or militia that had been issued rifles. The power of such a unit cannot be overstated in the chaotic conditions of 1918, while the Bolsheviks were trying to solidify their position in Petrograd. The Latvian riflemen would be so well used during the year that when the Latvian Socialist Soviet Republic needed their help to solidify its position in the newly Bolshevik country, they would almost be unable to render assistance, and that would be part of the reason that Latvia would not eventually be a Soviet Socialist Republic. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, 
And if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com GW50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com GW50 to get 50% off. Get ahead of postage rate increases this year with Stamps.com. It's like your own personal post office. Sign up with promo code PROGRAM for a four-week trial plus free postage and a free digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. That's Stamps.com code PROGRAM. Even closer to Petrograd than Latvia was Finland. Finland had been part of Russia since 1809 when it had been taken from Sweden. However, the Finns had always enjoyed some autonomy within the Russian Empire, and this autonomy was important to them, and it kept them reasonably happy members of the empire right until the end. That did not mean that all the Finns were happy to be Russians, though. And in the years leading up to the First World War, there was a well-developed and growing sense of Finnish nationalism. The disorder from the war then caused this group to push for further independence. After the February Revolution, the Finns had come to terms with the provisional government. However, the October Revolution saw the center and right-wing parties in Finland take control of the country. During the October elections, the socialists lost their majority in the Finnish parliament, but it did not remove the power of those socialists within the country, setting the country on its way to a civil war, a situation echoed in many other areas of the former Russian Empire. It would come at a time when the Bolsheviks in Moscow were ill-prepared to assist the socialists in Finland, and it would not go well for the Finnish Reds. This would be the most high-profile example of Red failure during these years. There would be other areas and other countries where the communist groups would attempt revolutions and they would fail, but in most of those areas they started at a position far weaker than the Finnish socialists had. This will not be the last time we look at the fighting in Finland, and it will receive its own episodes later this year. In many of these border conflicts, the Red Army would at least in some way be involved. However, this involvement would not be realized fully until after the German surrender in November 1918. Before that time, the German and Austrian armies still had a strong presence in the Baltics and Ukraine and many areas that were formerly Russian. However, the collapse of the German war effort, which led to the armistice, would open up a large power vacuum in the region, which the Bolshevik leaders in Petrograd saw as an opportunity. This led to the creation of an Army of the West, which would be formed soon after the German armistice was signed with the Western countries. The goal of this new army was to quite literally march west and spread the communist revolution as it went. In many cases, like in Ukraine and Poland and the Baltics, the goal of this army was not necessarily to straight out conquer the territory and bring it back into Russia, but instead to support local revolutionaries. They found that this support was frequently not enough, though, and in hindsight, it often was actively harmful to the fledgling revolutionary movements in the countries. In many of these areas, there were local nationalist sentiments, and having the Red Army, which most people still saw as Russian, move into these areas caused some previous supporters of the revolution, or at least neutral parties, to move into whatever camp was against the Russian encroachments. There would be a similar problem experienced by the white movement in Russia in the following years, it being seen as a puppet of foreign governments that were lending them support. The failures of the Bolsheviks in trying to put cooperative governments in power in 1918 and 1919 caused them to re-examine their future strategy in these countries, and in later years they would seek a more conciliatory path with whatever government was created in the territories. Instead of pouring men and resources into trying to put in place a Soviet government, which was often not supported by the local people. We're going to spend the rest of this episode talking about the formation and changes within the Red Army in the early years of the Civil War. When it came to the Red Army, the Bolsheviks had some problems, both conceptually and organizationally. The core of the conceptual problem was that one of the core tenets of Bolshevism was that the army was a weapon of the bourgeois against the proletariat. The more extreme Bolsheviks wanted the army completely destroyed to be replaced by a militia system that preserved the Bolshevik tradition of democratically elected officers. 
When the Bolsheviks then came to power, they were soon confronted by enemies that had organized, trained, and equipped armies that were at least reasonably loyal to them. Against these enemies, a loosely organized and purely voluntary democratic system of militias was seen as a huge liability. The biggest problem was projecting power over distances required for military campaigns in Russia. The men might be hundreds or even thousands of miles away from home, and it was difficult to get enough pure volunteers that accepted the requirements and the sacrifices. The Bolsheviks did have the Red Army, and er over the early years of the Civil War, it would slowly become more and more like the imperialist army that it had replaced. One of the first large shifts in that direction was the introduction of conscription. Conscription was basically forced upon the Red Army because there were nowhere near enough volunteers to fill its ranks, especially as it was forced to rapidly expand to meet the demands of the Civil War. In April 1918, compulsory military training was put in place for all workers and most of the peasantry. This training required them to be available to the army 12 hours a week and 8 weeks a year. Even this effort would be insufficient to meet the manpower needs of the Red Army, mostly due to the limited area that the Bolsheviks controlled in 1918 and 1919. They then took it a step further and instituted a policy of frontline mobilizations, where the Red Army advanced into new territory and it would draft up a bunch of conscripts on the spot to refill its ranks. Everyone knew that this was less efficient and produced soldiers of poor quality that were likely to desert, but on some level they just wanted warm bodies. Trotsky would justify all of these moves by claiming that it was the only way for the revolution to survive in a world filled with capitalists who wanted nothing more than to crush them, saying, quote, But the dictatorship of the proletariat cannot be exercised through an organization embracing the whole of that class, because in all capitalist countries, and not only over here, and one of the most backward, the proletariat is still divided, so degraded and so corrupted in parts by imperialism in some countries, that an organization taking in the whole proletariat cannot directly exercise proletarian di dictatorship. It can be exercised only by a vanguard that has absorbed the revolutionary energy of that class. The whole is like an arrangement of cogwheels. Such is the basic mechanism of the dictatorship of the proletariat and of the essentials of transition from capitalism to communism. This change in the composition and recruitment of the Red Army is one and maybe the clearest example of the Bolsheviks transitioning from the revolutionaries to the leaders of a country that was struggling against both internal and external enemies. Conscription would not be the only change made to the army, or even the only change made in 1918. As I mentioned earlier, one of these changes was the removal of the ability of units to elect their own officers. This had been a key part of the Red Army during the Revolutionary Period, and had been a key message sent by the Bolsheviks and other socialist parties as they tried to gain support within the old army. The problem was that the resulting officers were often found to be uh, less than ideal, and not just in the realm of military acumen, but also political reliability. This would result in the creation of the political commissars, which, was a, which are a pretty famous feature of the Red Army. These men were the extension of the party into the army, and they were present in the army both to keep an eye on the military officers, but also to use the army and the men within it as a way to extend the reach of the communist message. This was an important feature of the Red Army. It represented a way for the Bolsheviks to spread their messages to the masses that were being put in the, into the army in greater and greater numbers. They were also a captive audience. It's not like they could suddenly get away from these political messages. The goal was assisted by the large number of party members who would join the army in 1918. Upwards of half of the total members of the Communist Party would at one time be in the army early in the Civil War. But this would make up just a small fraction of the total number of men that would actually be in the Red Army, because the Red Army would have to massively increase in size during the conflict. Over the course of the Civil War years, and especially between 1918 and 1920, the Red Army would expand. By August 1918, there would be a few hundred thousand men in the army, but by 1920, there would be almost three million. Trying to scale a military force so rapidly and so quickly brought on a whole host of problems. Arming and supplying such a large number greatly strained the Russian economy, and without the army and the equipment left behind by the provisional government, much of which had been shipped in by the western countries during the war, it may not have been possible at all. Another problem was the huge desertion rate among the new recruits, a problem that was just as acute for the whites as it was for the reds. 
One of the reasons that the Red Army had to be so aggressive with its recruitment and conscription is that a large percentage of all the men who were brought into the army would slowly disappear over the course of a campaign. The desertion rate would decrease in time, and by 1920 it would be well within, I guess, what you would call reason. But during 1918 and 1919, it would be an issue that would weigh down the Red Army and its attempts to fight its enemy. It is impossible to discuss the Red Army during these early years without discussing the role that Trotsky would play in its creation and expansion. During the crucial years of the Civil War, Trotsky would be the leader of the Red Army, and he would approach this task with his usual energy. He would institute many of the reforms that we've already discussed, and he would also be a very active leader of the army. With the very fluid nature of the fighting, with armies marching and retreating sometimes hundreds of kilometers at a time, Trotsky was known to rush from one area to another to try and bolster the morale and fighting spirit of the Red Army. He did this by racing around in a special train. I like this quote from William Henry Chamberlain from his work The Russian Revolution 1917 to 1921. Now it's a very old book, so you have to take most of what is contained within it uh, with a very large grain of salt, but he would say this about Trotsky. Quote, in the vast panorama of confusion and disorder, the comet-like figure of Trotsky storming up and down the red lines, distributing new revolutionary military honors and orders for execution with equal prodigality, extorting and denouncing and always organizing for victory, was certainly one of the most decisive factors in bringing the whole Russian land under the red flag of the Soviets. End quote. Now this constant moving from front to front was not all positive though because having an army leader that is constantly on the move made it difficult for him to properly lead the entire army, and not just the piece being focused on at the time. This is one of the reasons that army leaders often stayed in one place, especially before the widespread use of wireless communication. It allowed them to establish and maintain communication networks with all of the leaders below them. When a leader was rushing around from front to front, these communication networks were almost impossible to create and coordinate. And so communication between the leader and all of the fronts was a real challenge. But even if he caused some issues for the army, no one should doubt the impact that Trotsky and his leadership had on the army during the Civil War years. He certainly had a tendency to bolster the troops wherever he was, and his leadership was invaluable. Trotsky would play a role in many of the changes to the army, but one more that I want to mention today was one he led for and argued for and really only Trotsky could have pulled this off, because it was very controversial, at least initially. So the Bolsheviks had always argued against the old army, and most of its vitriol was targeted on the officer class. However, when Trotsky came to power over the Red Army, he had an idea that could help solve many of the problems that the army had, especially the problems around the leadership. He wanted to bring in old Tsarist officers and put them in the Red Army. At first, the more radical leaders of the Bolshevik party were angry for Trotsky for even suggesting such a move. He wanted to reinstate the officers that represented everything the Bolsheviks had fought so hard against. But eventually, and with the support of Lenin, Trotsky's plan would be approved. Initially, the officers would be given the title of military specialists, but they were normal officers in all but name, and by the end of 1918, almost two-thirds of the Red Army's officer corps had formerly served in the old Tsarist army, and this number would be even higher among the upper ranks in the officer corps. These men represented an important force within the new army, and they made it a far more effective combat force. The loyalty of these officers was generally pretty good, and there were certainly some officers who would defect over to the Whites, especially Denikin's volunteer army, but these movements would quickly dissipate, partially due to the actions of the Western Allies, and specifically their intervention in the conflict, but that will be a topic for a later episode. Thank you for listening to what will be the first of six episodes on the Russian Civil War. Next episode, we will take a deep dive into the Bolshevik and later communist economic policies that they put in place in the areas of Russia that they controlled, and the reaction of those pe people in those areas to those new policies.